Ah, uh, you need a Bible today. Let me get mine. Let me get mine. I've uh, been wrestling with this message um, and what to preach uh, in relation to the events that took place yesterday. Uh, I got a call from Alicia, and uh, <clears throat> she said, Dad, Trump just got shot. And my heart sunk, and I didn't know exactly what to think, didn't know exactly uh, how bad it was, but uh, a lot of you who probably heard about it yesterday afternoon, not long after uh, it took place, uh, if you saw what I saw, um, you know, he had his head turned. Basically, he was facing the shooter. And that bullet, you can tell his reaction. It grazed his right ear, right here. Now, one inch to the left, and it's going to blow, it's going to cause his skull to explode. Uh, it it would have been a repeat of... JFK's assassination where the bullet coming from the front not the back the front basically just exploded his brain that's what the Zapruder film uh, was able to capture and that was the that was the trajectory that that bullet was going in yesterday I'm not a, a uh, forensics expert. I'm not a gun expert by far. I'm not a, a um, ballistics expert. Uh, I just know that if that would have been an inch to the left, uh, we would be waking up to a much different America than we did today. Um, you can say without any hesitation that it was divine providence. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that God favors Trump. I'm not saying that uh, he is uh, any kind of great born-again Christian. I don't know that. I'm just saying I recognize providence when I see it. I recognize how God works when I see it. And for uh, all the things that could have gone wrong yesterday that did not go wrong, uh, then you must, you must acknowledge that this was a divine hand upon those events of yesterday. Now, let me get to, uh, I just kind of threw this into my notes um, last night, and like I said, it, I wasn't really sure on what I was going to preach this morning or how I, if I was going to respond to this. But when I woke up this morning, there were some thoughts that were in my mind that uh, I kind of feel like the Lord had placed in there. I would like for you to turn to Psalm chapter 5. We're going to start from there. We're going to, and we just got a lot of scriptures today, so bear with me this morning. Psalm chapter 5, if you would. If you can read what's on the screen, then more power to you. But I would rather you see this from your Bible. And that way, there's a couple places I'm going to have you underline uh, for various reasons. And you'll see why in a little bit. Uh, let me just go ahead and give you the theme of what I'm thinking of uh, this morning. Uh, and that is... Um, whether you like Trump's personality or don't, uh, whether you think he is a polished and seasoned politician, he's not. Um, and I think that's what ap it appeals to most people, is that they are tired of voting in career politicians who make all kinds of promises to you, but really they're only using 
you, the American voter, to give themselves power. Power and money. Now, politicians, as far as I'm concerned, get paid pretty good salary. But everybody knows that there's more money to be gained by getting involved in politics than just that salary that you get paid by the, the state of Missouri or you get paid by the uh, federal government uh, in Washington, D.C. There's more money to be gained and thus more power. Some people that are in power, they don't really care much about money. They just use money as a means to get more power. And that is something I've said this before. I've preached this before. I don't understand that. I do not understand the desire to gain power over people. That, that just doesn't, it's not something that's wired into me, I guess. Uh, I don't really understand um, the, the idea of doing whatever it takes to enrich yourselves way beyond uh, the money, the amount of money that you're able to spend in a lifetime. I don't understand what compels rich people to want to have more riches when they know that there's no way in this life that they will ever be able to spend all of that money. I mean, if you, may, if you have a billion dollars to your name right now, you could not spend all of that. I don't think you could spend it in one lifetime. Not unless you just went out and gambled it all away. I think it'd take a long time to do that too. But So it's just some concepts that I don't understand, but I do understand what God says in His Word concerning all of this. But the idea is that Donald Trump represents um, a threat to what could be called the status quo in America. I mean, we are so used to this. I, I am, have always been a conservative voter. I remember the first election that I got to vote in when I turned 18, 1984, the presidential election, and buddy, I voted for Ronald Reagan and was proud to do it. In successive uh, elections, uh, whatever, whatever conservative person ran for office, um, I believed every word they said. I believed everything they were saying about the opposition. I thought that those guys could do no wrong, that they were the good guys, and we need to get all the good guys in because they're going to represent us. They're going to they're going to restore the things that the liberals have taken down in this country, like prayer and Bible and school and 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 uh, and all of those things. And I've also learned over the years that there are politicians on both sides that do nothing but use their voter base to put them back in power so that they can increase their power. And I'll never forget when this really sank home with me. Uh, this was after Lisa and I got married. There was a, uh, another election. I think it was the 88 election. And there was a man running for governor, William Webster. And he was a Republican, a, supposedly a conservative. And I thought, well, that's who I'm going to vote for. That's who I'm going to vote for. Turns out he was a crook, a bad one, and he spent years in prison. Now, had he gotten elected, I would have been guilty of electing a crooked politician into office. And over the years since then, I just, as I matured as a young man, I kind of got the idea that, you know, some so-called Republican or some so-called conservative candidates are not really that conservative and they don't really care for the things that I care for. Their heart really is not 
turn toward God and country and righteousness and doing what's right. They simply use that voter base to get elected. Because it looks good for George Bush to be seen with Franklin Graham before the election. It looks good on him to uh, come out and say that he's asked Jesus into his heart. He's a born... It looks good to the religious base that make up the conservative vote in this country. It looks good for them to be on their side. So I've been fooled before. I don't like being fooled. I don't like being lied to. But I will tell you that Donald Trump represents um, the destruction or at least a challenge to the status quo. The status quo meaning the elected officials who keep getting reelected and reelected and reelected and reelected. And it doesn't matter if they are on the left or on the right. It just sort of seems like that their agenda is always the same. More power, more power, more power, more money, more power. Uh, let's read Psalm chapter 5, and I'm going to try to make this uh, make some sense as we go through the scriptures. Psalm chapter 5, verse 1, that's what I have up on the screen. You read along with me in your Bible. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Underline that in your Bible. If you are looking for biblical reasons to vote for any particular candidate, this would be a good one right here. Thou art not a God that hath pleasure in Wickedness. And so right now there are conservative people in the Republican Party that are sodomites. They may vote conservative. They may vote against tax increases. They may vote against abortion. But the bottom line is they lead wicked, depraved lives. God is is not a God that has pleasure in that kind of wickedness. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen? Neither shall evil dwell with thee. And by the way, maybe this morning, instead of applying this to politicians, to leaders, to people running for office, or people, or bureaucrat, unelected bureaucrats, and so on, maybe we could start pointing the finger toward us who are in the churches every Sunday. Because I can tell you that the downfall of America, the, the reasoning for the downfall and destruction of America is to be laid on the front steps of every church and before the pulpits of America. When preachers and all they preach is wealth and health and prosperity and, and how God doesn't really see you as a sinner so therefore you can live whatever lifestyle you want to live and you can do whatever it is you want to do let me tell you about a god who looks at your life and if he sees somebody who thinks they can do whatever they want to i guarantee you god's got a rod about 15 foot long and he'll take you and he'll bend you over his knee and he'll apply that rod to your backside he'll put stripes on you that's what god will do god does not Put up with wickedness. Verse 5, thou, the, the foolish shall not stand in thy sight, and thou hatest all workers of iniquity. That goes to the politician. That goes to the pews. And that especially applies to the preachers. Verse 6, thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. Leasing means 
that your speech is full of holes. Is literally what it means. It means that you speak lies. You don't tell the truth. You can sit in a church service, say amen, hold your Bible up in the air, read the verses, pat the preacher on the back, and then go right out and live like the devil the rest of the week. God sees you if nobody else does, and God will judge you. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. I did something this morning that I told you that I don't normally do. And that is, I watched the news. And it was local news, Fox 2. And I was very disturbed at the number of advertisements for political candidates in St. Louis who are all out there trying to prove that they are more pro-murder of children than their other candidate is. We will stand for the murder of children so that the people of St. Louis can have a better life, is what they said. Now, they didn't say murder of children, but I'm saying they're saying they stand for the murder of unborn children. Because that's what it is, and we have to call sin what sin is. It, abortion is not a choice. It is not a, something that a woman does to her own body. I heard it this way. The body, ladies, that's in your body is not your body. That child has its own unique set of DNA. And if it came down to it in a, in a court of law, then that child representing a potential human being has a completely different set of DNA than anybody else in the entire world. That means that they're alive, they are unique, and nobody has the right to go in and kill that. But these, I'm, I'm not kidding you, these politicians, they were, they were climbing all over themselves saying, Oh, I'm more pro-abortion than our candidate is. I'm more pro-abortion than they are. In fact, I'm going to restore abortion rights to this area so that we can have a better life. And what gets me is some of these people, they all go to churches. And in their churches, that's, that's the same thing that you hear there. Pro-abortion. Pro, they call it pro-choice. I'm sorry, but it's a death cult, if you ask me. You have the blood. I mean, look at that verse again. Verse 6. The Lord will abhor the bloody and deceitful man. They have blood on their hands. Those who commit the abortions. Those who uh, have empowered the politicians that have empowered the abortion mills to spill innocent blood are guilty. And then the people who voted in the politicians who have empowered the doctors and nurses and abortion mills uh, all over the area to commit more murders of innocent children, they are guilty as well. You say, I don't know if I believe that, Pastor Mike. Well, let me read to you Romans chapter 1. If you want to turn there. Romans chapter 1 lays the blame for the sins of people and what they do, not only on the sinners, but it also lays the blame and the guilt on those who favor their sins. Look at, yeah, amen. Look at verse 29, Romans chapter 1, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, murder. Debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud. The whole month of June was what? Pride month. Boasters, 
Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. You're just as guilty. You empowered the people to be put in office whose, uh, whose very uh, political thinking and political processes have everything to do with murdering unborn, innocent human beings. It is a death cult. Verse 7, back in Psalm 5, but as for me, I will come into thy house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear will I worship toward thy holy temple. Lead me, O Lord, in thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Now I want you to notice verse 8. You have enemies. If you are going to live a life centered upon Jesus Christ... And the Ten Commandments. If you're going to lead a life that says, I'm going to follow Christ. I don't care if I lose all of my worldly goods. I don't care if I lose my freedoms. And I don't care if I lose my life. I am going to serve my God the way the Bible tells me to do it. If that's you, say amen. That is a weak amen. That's getting better. Look at verse 9 now. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Let's apply that, number one, to the politicians. Number two, to the preachers. The heads of denominations. Popes, prosperity, uh, prophets, and so on. There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. That means they're rotten to the core. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. What is a sepulcher? It's a tomb. You know, when I read that, you know what it made me think of? Uh, let me get down to Matthew 23. Turn there. Well, I got a lot to give out. I'm going to try to do this ex expeditiously. Matthew 23. When I read that in Psalm 5 about their mouth was an open sepulcher. I immediately thought of what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Look at starting at verse 13. Woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think of Matthew 23 in this context. The scribes of Pharisees were the status quo. They were the religious power over all the Jews and they hated John the Baptist number one and then they doubly hated Jesus and the reason was was that both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ were there to dismantle their temples to their own power um, their own false doctrine, their power over the people, and I'm talking about religious power. Religious power actually is a stronger power than political power. You can, with political power, you must use guns, you might threaten with bombs and artillery uh, or armies in order to enforce your power. But with religious power, you frighten people by telling them that if you don't do what I tell you to do, then you're going to spend eternity in hell 
forever and there will be no escape for you. There will be no salvation for you. You must do what I tell you to do. And in that sense, I think religious power is much stronger than political power. I must be careful as your pastor to not try to gain power over you or advantage over you or tell you that if you don't listen to Pastor Mike, why, well, you're probably on your way to hell. In fact, you're probably not even saved if you don't like something I said. I've got to be careful about that because I'm going to give an account to God for the things that I've laid in front of the people. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, verse 14, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Look at, look at what Jesus is saying here to the... Um, to the priests, to the preachers, to the pastors. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple... He is a debtor. In other words, they have placed your salvation and the covenant of your salvation is based upon earthly things rather than heavenly things. Let me make this clear just so that everybody understands. I think you should already know it about me or know it about what I believe and what I stand for. But I've said this many times. There isn't one thing in this church building there isn't one thing in this uh in this church collected this congregation and myself there isn't anything in this world that you must have or attain to in order to get the gift of eternal life in fact this church does not confer upon people the gift of salvation that is given by god and by god alone somebody say amen it's not given by a church. It's not given by a priest. It's not given by a pope, a bishop, archbishop, cardinals, or any of that junk. It's not given when you come down and eat the communion. It's not given to you when you're baptized in the water. That thing means, as far as your eternal life, it means very little, if anything. How many people who have died before they ever took the Lord's Supper are still in heaven. All of them. How many people who have died before they had an opportunity to be baptized? I'm thinking of the thief on the cross. What water did Jesus have on him to where he could even sprinkle the thief on the cross? He didn't have anything. And yet he told him that simply because of his belief, this day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Amen. Amen is right. So, in verse 17, Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? Verse 18, And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he's guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whether is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar, sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven, sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. Verse 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. Let me stop right here. Woe be to any pastor or I'll say this denominational group where the pastor extends favors and grace 
and looking the other way when it comes to people in the church who tithe and give great sums of money. Y'all know what I'm talking about? The pastor, in my opinion, has no right knowing who in the church gives what. If someone say amen that, that you think that's a good idea. Why is, it, why is it a good idea that I don't know who pays what? So I won't show what? You think preachers do that? You better believe they do. In fact, I've, I've just run into some preachers in my, in my lifetime. I knew that they were extending favoritism and looking the other way at people that they knew gave large sums of money and never, never questioned them never called them out on it. They had positions in the church, sat on committees, sat on boards. And the pastor knew their sin and wouldn't touch it. Why? Because of their money. I've heard stories, I've heard horror stories. One church that I knew of, I knew the, I knew the pastor, the, the preacher that went out to take this church to be pastor. He was doing good there, preaching against sin. There was a man in the church who owned several uh, pharmacies in the area. He was a rich man. He wasn't on any of the committees or the boards of the church, but he had family members on every single one of them. When the pastor got there with his family and his children, this man offered to pay the tuition for his children to go to the best Christian school in the area. Pastor thought this was great. Then he found out that the man was laundering hundreds of thousands of dollars through the church from his pharmacies every year. He called two different legal organizations, Christian Law Association, J. Seculo. He called them both and both told him, they said, he's laundering money through the church and now that you know about it, you need to do something about it or if the feds get involved, you're going down with him. And he sat the man down for lunch one day and told him, he said, this is what I found out. I found out that you're doing this and I found out, you may not know this, but I found out that basically that's tantamount to laundering money. You know what the guy did? He just kind of sat back, toothpick in his mouth. And he said, you know, I thought you were smarter than that. Preacher said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're getting paid pretty good here. You got your kids in the Christian school. Everything you want, you've got. He said, why don't you just be like the other preachers? Take the money and mind your own business. The attitude of that man. Finally, the preacher, they had a big meeting and the preacher won a vote of confidence, but he resigned. And he said, I, I can't do this. And he left. And that church went right back to the status quo. See, that's what I'm talking about, the status quo. If the status quo is wrong, it needs to be destroyed. If the denomination is turning more and more away from the Word of God, then any church that's got any sense in the world about what's right and how the Word of God needs to be magnified if they continue along in that, I, you know, I believe they can go along for a while. Maybe things will change. Maybe it'll get better. But after consistently seeing that there are people who are actively working against God's word in any denominational system, it falls upon the individual churches to come out of Babylon and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Amen. 
I want you to look at, oh, let's see here. Let's pick this up now in verse 27. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited, what? Sepulchers. There it is. That's the connection with Psalm 5. Which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye built the tombs of the prophets, garnished the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets, Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can you escape the damnation of hell? That is the state of religion in America. That is the state of Christianity in America. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the islands that we stopped off in, it was a British Virgin Island. And God kept leading me to this taxi driver. I mean, we just kept getting back in his line of sight until finally I said, can you give us a tour of the island? He said, sure, that's what I've been waiting on. Get in the car. And he had a real nice car and took us around, air conditioned, you know, and, and uh, talking, of, talking about the island and its history. Well, come out. He asked me, he said, did I hear you say that you were a pastor? And I said, no, you didn't hear me say that. I said, but I am. And he said, I'm one too. He said, what denomination? I said, Baptist. He said, I'm Baptist too. And buddy, I want to tell you what. We started a conversation that, I mean, included just about everything wrong with America. And I agreed with him. I said, amen, amen, amen. I preach this stuff seven, eight times a week if I'm able to. Uh, you know what his name was? Lord Byron. Lord Byron. I'll never forget him. But people, our, our country has a rot in it. Our, our systems of Christianity, our denominations are full of corruption. So is our political bases in this country full of corruption. And any time you have someone who decides to speak out against the corruption, they're going to be a target. Let me run through these very quickly. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 32, 1, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, which was the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. For then the king of Babylon's army besieged Jerusalem, and Jeremiah the prophet was shut up in the court of the prison, which was in the king of Judah's house. For Zedekiah, king of Judah, had shut him up, saying, Wherefore dost thou prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall take it. Zedekiah, Jeremiah said that. He said it by way of the word of the Lord. Jeremiah was not wrong in what he was saying. And yet Zedekiah took what he said. Now, Jeremiah wasn't going to be the one that was going to have uh, all of the religious base and all of the uh, uh, all of the kingdom in Judah uh, destroyed. Jeremiah wasn't going to do it with his bare hands. All he did was speak out and say, this is what God is going to do. And for that, they threw him into prison. There is coming a time and it, it already is that those who speak the truth will end up being martyrs. For speaking the truth. I can have. Sermons taken off of YouTube. For simply challenging. Whether or not. Any of the vaccines. Are actually good. And capable of getting rid of. Of these diseases that have popped up. I can get it kicked off YouTube for that. Just for challenging it. They say I'm giving out medical misinformation. All I'm doing is asking a question. 
Is this really good for us? Is it okay to do this? And will it actually uh, make us exempt from the disease? I can also get videos pulled down and taken off for challenging the status quo on the election. And have. I've been censored. Videos taken down, strikes put against my channel. And I'm not someone who thinks I have the truth on everything. I've got the goods. I've got secret information. Insiders and whistleblowers come to me and they tell me what's really going on. And uh, people don't fall for a lot of that stuff. But all I can do is say, I think something bad happened in our country the night of an election. I think that this COVID thing was an engineered virus in a lab from somewhere. This sermon will get taken down from YouTube for me saying that. They do not want people going against the status quo, even if they tell the truth. Jeremiah was thrown in prison. Peter and John, turn to Acts chapter 4. I wonder why all of a sudden our microphone's buzzing. Y'all hear that? Huh? Oh. Acts chapter 4 verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men... They marvel. And now look at that phrase right there, unlearned and ignorant men. That is, that is the position of a lot of your liberal politicians. They are Harvard University students. They're New York University. They're Yale. They're skull and bones men. They're all these elitist people running our government. And when the people stand up and say, this is what we want. We get told we're not smart enough to know what we want. Well, I'm smart enough to know that I don't want a man holding the nuclear football who can even come up with a decent sentence in a, in a debate. So, they look down on us because we're unlearned and ignorant. And they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed, standing with them, they, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it, but that it spread no further. They do not want the knowledge of this to go anywhere else. They want to clamp down on it. So that no one finds out. That a man has been healed. That it spread no further. Verse 17. Among the people. Let us straightly threaten them. That they speak henceforth to no man. In the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them. Oh, excuse me. I missed a line here. Verse 18, and they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot speak the things which we have seen and heard. So uh, when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years on whom this miracle of healing was showed. They healed a man. They gave him his, his health back, his life back. And when they dared say that it was under the name of Jesus, then the religious status quo brought him in and threatened him. And they said, we'll beat you. We'll scourge you. We'll imprison you. We'll take away your livelihood. We'll threaten your family. We'll do all kinds of things. You cannot speak this to anybody else. And why did they do that? It was for fear that they would lose 
the power base that they had in their religious hierarchy. Some of you might remember, but some of you may not know everything. Two years ago, Michael and the head of our security in Kenya, OT, twice they were poisoned to try to assassinate them. Twice, I think, had the brakes lines cut on their car so that their brakes would fail. A man that we had hired to help run our radio stations, I do not think he worked alone. I think he had help. He was two signatures away from stealing both of our radio stations away from us. Our head of security, in a more recent event, was kidnapped in Turkana. He was there to help with a feeding. They forgot to take his cell phone away. He signaled to Michael, who was here, what was going on. Michael made some phone calls and a rescue team was sent. There was six men dressed up in police uniforms that had taken him hostage, taken him, he thought they were going to kill him, but that's not what they had planned to do. They took him to a, an office building, vacant And I won't say much more, but I can tell you this. They had the means to frame him for murder. And I won't tell you how we know who was behind it, but I will tell you that shortly after the four Catholic priests in that area were removed from their positions and sent elsewhere. Why? Is because the Catholic Church is the status quo in that area. They have a very large stronghold over those people and we come along with the messages that we preach and we challenge that and it's working. Less people are going to the Catholic Church in Turkana now. And more are listening to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. That happens. Stephen, Acts chapter 7, turned there. When they had heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with a cord, one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, Stephen, challenged the status quo and paid for it with his life. Then we have James and Peter. Acts chapter 12, turn there. That about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And I'm here to tell you the church became one of the most hated organizations in that time. Hated by the politicians, hated by the Roman politicians, hated by the Jewish politicians, hated by uh, the, the, the religious people, those who ran the temple of Diana, hated by the Jewish Sanhedrin, the Jewish elders. And so in verse 2, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. For what? 
Did James take a sword and kill Roman soldiers? No. Did James take a sword or a bow and arrow and, and try to kill members of the Sanhedrin? Did he try to kill Herod? No. For what act of violence was James killed? Nothing. He was killed simply because of what he said. And what he said was dangerous to the status quo. Dangerous, dangerous to the religious establishment, dangerous to the political establishment. And I submit to you that as this country goes worse and worse and worse, and we maintain our stand on the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we are a threat to the religious status quo and the political status quo, not only in this country, but around the world. And because, verse 3, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. They killed James, and they were going to kill Peter as well. We do believe by uh, history and by tradition that Peter was eventually killed. For one reason, George, he preached in the name of Jesus. And that made him a threat. Paul, Acts 23, Paul earnestly beholding the council said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. And the high priest Ananias came, commanded them that stood by him to smite him on the mouth. They punched Paul in the mouth. Then said Paul unto him, God shall smite thee, thou whited wall. Look at that. Whited sepulcher. God shall smite thee, thou whited wall, for thou sittest, for sittest thou to judge me after the law, and commandest me to be smitten contrary to the law. And they that stood by said, Revilest thou God's high priest, in other words, how dare you speak against the high priest? It'd be like now if, if we were to send a message out of this church that we stand against the evil of the papacy and the evil pope, the Jesuit pope that they have running it. We stand against it. I need one more martyr. I need one more person from the Bible that stood against the status quo, that preached against it, calling them serpents and generations of vipers who ended up paying with his life for the rhetoric that he spread around and the words that he said. Who would it be? Turn to Mark 15. There was one named Barabbas which lay bound with him that had made insurrection with him who had committed murder in the insurrection. How many murders did Jesus commit? In fact, Jesus committed the opposite of murder. He brought people back to life. Jesus didn't kill anybody. He even, he even chewed Peter out when Peter took a sword and cut off Malchus' ear. Jesus went and screwed it back on. Peter, put down your sword. Not only did Jesus not make insurrection against the Jews or Caesar, but he didn't preach to us that we should. And yet they despised him. They hated him. In verse 8, the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them saying, will, will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. 
But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said un again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why? What evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. I want you to take your Bibles now and turn to Matthew 24. I preached this during Sunday school this morning. I want you to look at Matthew 24, verse 8. And I'm going to ask you this question this morning. I said all these to say this. Who in here would be willing to rise up and be a voice of dissent against the religious status quo and the political status quo in this country? Who in here would be willing to trade your life for the principles that you believe in? Who in here would be willing to have your bank accounts frozen by the IRS, your house seized, To lose everything that you've worked for in this world. For the sake of, number one, pointing at political figures in this country and saying, there's the traitors. We're not the traitors. And would also speak out against the religious people in this country, and I don't care if they're on the extreme left or the extreme right or right down the middle. Wrong is still wrong. And wherein someone diverges away from the words that are in this book, they are wrong. In, in Matthew 24... In verse 8, well, let me read verse 7. Nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Look at verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. I can tell you, those of you who were here for Sunday school, the message that I taught during Sunday school puts me on the list of heretics by those who who would disagree with me. They wouldn't just say of me, well, you know, uh, Mike's got some good ideas, but I, I think he's just wrong on that. But, you know, we're probably all wrong about something. No, 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 no. They not wouldn't be near that nice. I've had them call me every name in the book. Heretic. False teacher. False prophet. My goodness, they've even accused me of being a member of the Masonic Lodge. Oh, he's a, he's a secret agent. He's the one that's going to tell us to get on the FEMA trucks and go to the FEMA work camps. I've had, listen, I've had them say all that about me. But when you stand against the status quo, plan on doing it alone. You may not get anybody to stand with you. 
But what did Paul say? Having done all to stand. Now I'm going to call you out this morning. Who would be willing? You better listen to what I say. To forsake father, mother, spouse, brother, sister, son, and daughter. To stand up for Jesus and for what's right. Prove it. Stand up, prove it. You know, I can't help but look at, let me get back here. I can't help but look at that and say, I may not agree with everything he agrees to, but a man that is that dangerous to the status quo in this country gets my vote. That man has withstood personal attacks. They've attacked his son. They've attacked his wife. They've attacked his family. They have attacked him. There are probably things that they tried to do while he was president that we don't know about and probably never will know about. Withstood the abandonment of people in his own party. The man that he put the most confidence in during the election turned their backs on him. They've tried to impeach him. They've tried to bring up charges against him in so many different ways as to think that surely he'll lose some of these and then not be able to run for president. They, they hate him so much. And it's not hatred, it's fear. They fear him so much that they are willing to pull out all the stops and to do whatever it takes no matter what it takes to make sure that he never swears the oath of office ever again. And he came one inch away from giving his own life. You think he's going to hide now on his next rallies and speeches? Not a chance. And I don't know, I, like I say, we, there's not anybody that all of us are going to agree with everything that they think or do when they get into the White House. But I'm telling you, the man that has feared this much deserves our support. Father, we come before you this morning. And here's this man that, God, I don't know where he stands with you. He says he favors Christianity, favors you, favors Jesus. Says that when he becomes president again, he's going to establish a, uh, something that will help promote Christianity in this country instead of to actively work against it. But God, when I see this man and the attacks that he has suffered the financial loss that uh, he's had to bear, the physical loss that he's had to endure, times when maybe they tried to poison him, times when he was turned against by 
people closest to him. And then yesterday, an assassin's bullet coming within an inch of taking him out permanently. It tells me that this man is the man that I want to be my leader. And I will gladly march behind him. Father, we pray for the family of the shooter. And I pray, Father, Lord, that you would help them as they deal with the questions concerning their son. Father, I pray for the family of the man who was killed. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that his sacrifice would not be in vain. Father, we pray, dear God, for the man himself. Obviously, God, you protected him. There is no question and there's no doubt about it. You protected him yesterday. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that it would be for a greater good. And that, Father, that if he is allowed to be president once again, God, that you would watch over him, that you would protect him. And, Father, that you would uh, spoil any efforts by people, even the ones closest to him, any efforts of taking him out, Lord, and, and the things that people are going to try against him, Lord, that they would turn to naught and they would be a thing of naught. Let no weapon that is forged prevail against him. And Father, we ask, Father, of ourselves... Would we be just as willing to take a bullet and yet go on standing up for the things that we believe in, the things that we hold dear? These are not just preferences of our life. These are truths given to us by you, sent down through your word, truths that cannot be denied. Truths, Father, that cannot be argued against. Your word is truth. And if it costs us our very lives, if it costs us our fortunes, our houses, all of our things, if our family leaves us, if our friends forsake us, if all of the other people who say they are Christians turn their back against us, Father, may we ever stand for the word of God and for truth. Father, bless us, Lord, today. Help us, dear God, to be repurposed and recommitted in our efforts to share the gospel, even with those who don't want to hear it, to share the gospel, giving people an opportunity, a chance to meet Jesus as their Lord and as their Savior. Dismiss us now, Father, in your care. We thank you, dear God, for the day that you've given us. Bless the name of the Lord. Bless your word above your name. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed.